All right, let's put this up here. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Oh, can I stand on this? Okay. I don't know if that's some kind of insult, like they know I'm short, so they've got this special little ribbon. Actually, rather rickety contraption here. Who knows what might happen? Gosh, now like I'm towering over this podium and all the rest of you folks. Okay. Well, all right. Now I know how all you tall people have it. All right. Well, anyway, a real, it's a great pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, I spent a little bit of last night at, uh, we'll just call it the other convention. Ooh, yeah, that's right. I was there. And there were a bunch of those people who said, we'd love to come hear you tomorrow, but, you know, we don't want to get in trouble for being involved with the libertarians. Ooh, terrible. But I think a lot of what you guys do is uh, thankless work. Sometimes it's unbelievable drudgery, and yet you just do it and do it and do it, and you keep on doing it anyway. And it doesn't always bring immediate success. It just brings more drudgery and more work, and yet you just keep at it. And I deeply respect people who do that. So I'm very glad to be able to talk to you. So what I'm doing today is I'm giving two speeches. Now, how can that be? How can this schmuck give two speeches? Well, I, I decided I want to give... First, I want to start with, here's what I would say. Let's suppose what we all crave is that if only we could grab the whole country by the throat for just like a half hour. If we could just talk to people for a half an hour, what would we say to them that would leave them libertarians on the other side of that? That's what I want to do. But then I also thought, but I also want to talk to the libertarians. I don't want to talk to these imaginary non-libertarians for the whole speech. I also want to talk to the libertarians, so I'm going to give two speeches. So the first one is, what would I say to the whole world if I had their attention after they've gone through 12 years of government propaganda and they've been told the exact opposite of everything I'm going to say to them, what would I in fact say? And then secondly, what would I say to a bunch of libertarians if I just happened to have them in a room together? And guess what? Look, hey, hey, here I am. So we're going to do both of those and then sort of tie it all up together. So we're going to zip right along. Now, everything I say will not be footnoted, given the time involved, and I have so much to try to cover, because I'm trying to convince people who have spent their entire, well, youth anyway, in an institution funded by the government whose job it is to make them into conformists. So it is tricky. I have a lot to say to these people. So I'm going to zip through it. So I would start, first of all, I find it, there's a certain irony in what happens at your high school graduation when you always get that speech about you've got to follow your dreams. You can accomplish anything. But yet, the whole 12 years you've been in that school, they've been teaching you the exact opposite. You can't do anything. Only the government makes possible civilized life, and only the government makes it possible for you to survive and earn a living, and only the government makes it possible for you to work in decent conditions, and only the government makes the arts possible, only the government makes the sciences possible. Government, 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 government. But hey, you can do anything you want. What does that mean? Like, well, how do they have the nerve to give that speech? But anyway, they do. And so we are sort of, I don't know, propagandized into thinking that all the good things in the world come from some guy being in charge and telling everybody else what to do. People look to the, the example of the military and they say, look at the military. Military gets stuff done. We've got a guy in charge and people who obey. So this should be the model for all of society. This is the, the sense people have. That's why I think some people accepted the idea that central economic planning was a good idea. Because it seemed to them, wouldn't it be better and more efficient for there to be some guy barking out orders to everybody instead of everybody just doing whatever he wants? That sounds chaotic and disorderly. We can't have that. So, first I would tell people, there are miracles that go on every single day in this world that occur simply because individuals are acting. Like, think, for example, there was nobody in charge of the English language. There was no one guy who said, okay, everybody, I've decided, I've decided. The word for this is tree. Everybody got that? It's going to be tree from now on. Like, that didn't happen. And so it's not even like, as my friend Bob Murphy puts it, it's not that dictionary companies invented English. It's not like dictionary companies just forced upon us the meanings of the words. The dictionary companies are merely codifying our already customary practice of designating this as a tree. 
So where does English come from? It comes from just spontaneous interaction of people. There is no czar or commissar or planner of the English language, and yet there it is. But you could imagine, you could just imagine people today thinking that there must have been some English language commissar who developed the language. Or, or how about take a scientific field like physics? Now physics has progressed tremendously over the centuries, and yet there is no guy. There's no guy with a giant physics hat and he's wearing a lab coat, he's in charge of physics. There's nobody in charge of physics. They have physics journals, and the journals weed out, are supposed to weed out the bad articles, publish the good ones, and people build upon each other's work, and the result is this tremendous edifice of physics. And yet it develops with no guy doing it. No one even stops to marvel at this. But this contradicts this idea that you need some guy in charge. No, what's miraculous is how how much we get done with nobody in charge, with just human beings interacting with each other like uh, with other human beings, just, that's it. Where, where we interact with each other without some guy with a bullhorn. And it's astonishing what we can accomplish. Like for example, I'm sure everybody in this room is at least familiar with that Leonard Reed essay that Milton Friedman popularized, I Pencil. So Milton Friedman holds up this pencil and he says, look, I got a freaking pencil over here. You look at the things in this pencil, and you realize there's no person on earth who could, who could produce this pencil. And you're skeptical of that. You think, oh, I know. I know Joe works at the pencil factory. He could make a pencil. But when you think about it, it's actually quite difficult. The pencil begins with a tree. You've got to chop down the tree. What are you going to chop down the tree with? Well, you're going to need uh, an ax or you need a saw. What's the saw going to be made out of? It's going to be made out of steel. And for steel, you need iron ore. And then you need transportation to transport the steel from one place to another. The transportation requires gasoline, which requires uh, oil refinery. All these different things that you would need to be an expert in to create a pencil, no human brain could possibly contain. So there are all, the, and that's not to mention the rubber for the eraser, the graphite, which comes from South America, all these different things coming together to produce an object that costs you a few cents. Now, could you imagine, before we had pencils, describing to people, all right, here's what we need to do. All right, first we've got to go to this continent, then that continent, then we've got to get the graphite, we've got to chop down the tree, we've got to produce paint, requires all these ingredients and all these processes. Then we've got to shave down the, the wood to make it all nice and smooth. Where people would say, my gosh, this, this device is going to cost like a billion dollars, and we're going to need some pencil commissar in charge of this thing. We would never have produced a pencil. No one would even try. And yet this happens every single day, and nobody even notices it. Nobody even notices the miracle of this without any central direction, without that bullhorn guy. These miracles go on every day, and we are not ever taught to stop and appreciate them for a change. In fact, there was one time I had a sick child. She needed a vaporizer in the middle of the night. So in the middle of the night, I go to the store, I buy her a vaporizer for $10. And I actually, this is not a joke, I stood there in the store and I marveled at the fact that I just bought a vaporizer for my sick kid in the middle of the night for $10. And this is incredible. Think of all the things that had to come together to make this possible. And then I realized, wait a minute, I have a sick kid. I can't really be standing around here philosophizing. I gotta get, I gotta get out of here. But you know what we are taught to do, though, in school? We're not taught to appreciate markets or the price system that makes all this miraculous stuff possible. No, we're taught how a bill becomes a law. So right away, it prejudices people in favor of government activity. I know all about how a bill becomes a law, but I have absolutely no idea how a pencil could be possible. And I have so no idea about it that I don't even have the idea to ask myself the question. So these miracles take place every day. And in fact, on the free market, we have what the great Frederick Bastiat called economic harmonies. That on the market, we are all acting harmoniously in cooperation and concert together. That workers and businessmen have the same interests, not contrary interests, the same interests. The businessman wants low taxes on his business so that he can make more profits. But the worker also wants low taxes on that business because the more profits that are earned, the more the businessman can invest those profits in capital equipment, that makes the worker more physically productive, that means more goods are produced, and more, when more goods are produced, vis-a-vis -vis the amount of money in the economy, that makes your money worth more. The money stays roughly the same, the goods are increased, 
we all become wealthier through this process. The only thing government can contribute to that healthy process is stagnation and retrogression. That's it. All they can do is tax this wonderful process by which all of us working together improve our living conditions. But what does the state create? Does it create economic harmonies? No, the state can only create conflict. It gives a special privilege to one group that harms the other groups. That encourages the other groups to lobby for their own special privileges, which in turn harm everyone else. And it encourages a kind of low intensity civil war of all against all. There's no economic harmonies there. Now, but, but they say that what I'm saying to you is too simplistic. They say that freedom yields you bad things. It yields you poverty, poor working conditions, and all the rest of it. All the things we learned in the seventh grade. The free market gives you all those things. But as I just explained, it's the market that curbs those things. Imagine in the 18th century, imagine the year 1700. Why are people poor in 1700? Is it because the rich people are wickedly depriving the poor of all the flat screen TVs in the year 1700? Why is it? Why is it that in the year 1700, nobody protests against the existence of poverty? It's because in the year 1700, it never occurred to anyone that you could abolish poverty. It, it, was, it was assumed that the world you're gonna be born into is a filthy world of squalor you're going to live your life one bad harvest away from starvation, and then you're going to drop dead. No one had figured you could get away with a life better than that. It's only when you get the market economy, it's so fantastic as a wealth creator that you realize, wait a minute, people don't have to live like savages anymore. It is possible to lift people out of this thing. Well, the reason people are poor in 1700 is they're doing most of their work by hand. Imagine if today we get rid of all the equipment we use to produce things, we produce everything by hand. We would produce like what, one three hundredth of what we produce now, if even that? And there would be whole classes of goods we couldn't produce at all. Tr try to engage in, in, in coal mining with just your bare hands. Good luck. Try to engage in, in any type of mining or raw material extraction of any kind. Forget it. None of that stuff could even be done. So of course they're going to be poor. It's not that the rich have taken all the stuff from them. If you redistributed everything the rich person had in 1700 and gave it to everybody else, Everybody else would wind up with an extra two cents and then that would be it. That rich person would move out of the country before this could be done to him again. That'd be it. Congratulations. The only way you can improve things is by letting the market function, let profits be reinvested, and build that machinery so that we become more productive. Goods become more abundant and their prices come down relative to wages. That is the only way we can become better off. I've talked about working conditions in a couple of my books. I won't uh, dwell on that, but that is also something that the market makes possible. If we went over to Bangladesh today and said, you people have to work in terrible conditions, so today we're going to impose the U.S. Federal Register of Regulations upon the whole country, would that mean that the next day everyone would be working in a wonderful air-conditioned office building? No, it would mean the next day everybody's unemployed. No one could afford that in Bangladesh. So it can't possibly be uh, quite that simple, and it, it is indeed the market that makes possible the wealth that allows us to work in, in better conditions. In fact, I have got, I just returned from Spain, so I hardly even know what time it is or what day it is or what country I'm in, but I was in Spain earlier this week, I gave a talk there. People were telling me that in Spain, it is so difficult to start a business. There is so much bureaucracy and so much red tape that only the very wealthy can afford to do it which is why you see gigantic businesses there. You don't see, even in this country with our curtailed freedoms, we still have some small entrepreneurs popping up. You just don't see that in Spain. You're either poor or you're super duper rich because only the super duper rich can possibly navigate the regulatory thicket that the state has imposed. The state, by the way, which portrays itself as the great savior of the poor. Well, how about poverty around the world? Is that the fault of the free market? Is that the fault of you and me, of us being free? Well, in fact, this is the century, the 21st century and the 20th century combined. These are the centuries where we've started to see, after some, some years of, 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 of third way central planning, we started to see in the mid 20th century, but starting really in, this, in the 80s, a lot of liberalization of the good sort around the world. And what did we see? Poverty fell dramatically. Absolute poverty amounted to 85% of the world population in 1820. By 1950, that was down to 50%. By the early 1980s, down to 33%. And by 2001, down to 
The world has never seen that amount of, of poverty alleviation ever, ever, at the very time that markets are opening up. Never seen any progress like this. Do we read that in the newspaper? Hey, great news, everybody. The New York Times, hey, great news. Look, poverty is really, no, nothing, nothing. We are led to believe that the poor are poor because the rich took all their stuff. When did these poor people have all that stuff, for one thing? I mean, this is, or, or the poor get poorer, or the rich get richer. It's, this can't possibly be The poor, at some point you hit subsistence level. If you get any poor, I mean, I, the, the, the phrase doesn't even make sense. But exactly the opposite is the truth. Now, governments did try to help people. We had foreign aid programs in the 20th century. And everybody, all the experts said the foreign aid programs are indispensable to lifting these people out of poverty. What did these foreign aid programs do? They kept these people in poverty, in case after case after case. There is almost nothing in the history of mankind that has a worse record than Western, than Western governments and their state-led development schemes. Absolutely appalling. It led to retrogression, not progress. This was the attempt of governments to help. When they stopped helping, things got a lot better. When Chile had foreign aid cut off, when South Korea had foreign aid cut off, or Hong Kong, these places flourished because no longer could their crummy statist policies be subsidized. They have to adopt the free market. The result was fantastic prosperity. Well, how about domestically? How about in the United States? Surely government got rid of poverty in the U.S. Where would we be without our overlords here, right? We'd all be impoverished, earning two cents an hour, digging in a ditch somewhere. Well, it turns out that in the U.S., if we look at modern standards of what constitutes poverty, in the year 1900, poverty claimed 95% of the population. By the late 1960s, that was all the way down to 12 to 14%. The amount of anti-poverty federal initiative during that time is so, so negligible as not to be worth talking about. And yet, poverty fell dramatically during that time. Then the government really got involved. The late 60s is when the Great Society programs really started to get funding. Then the government got involved. Then what happened to poverty? So it had been coming down like this. Then what happened? Then it stagnates. Now, we can talk about what the reasons for that would be, why these programs are counterproductive, and again, in some of my books I've talked about that. But the point is, there is this brute fact of the poverty rate going like this, and then the government gets involved and it goes like this. Now, suppose the situation had been reversed. Suppose the government was spending a lot on poverty all these years, and, and then we saw poverty fall. And then the government, because evil libertarians got in charge, the government stopped spending money on it, and then poverty leveled off. You know what we would hear. Well, this just goes to show government spending is what alleviates poverty. And if we get rid of the government spending, then it stagnates. But exactly, exactly the opposite is the truth. So what do we hear in the headlines or in textbooks? Nothing. Crickets. Nothing at all. No acknowledgement of this whatsoever. And the domestic analog to foreign aid has been the welfare state. And the welfare state has corresponded with a stagnation in the poverty rate, the same way that foreign aid to other countries responded in, in the same way. All right, so the other thing is, well, if we have freedom, then the environment is going to be damaged and you know, we're all going to die instantly. Now, I understand that sort of argument. We should remember that the workers' paradises where you had centrally planned economies were not known for environmental quality. In fact, in the Soviet Union, it was a crime, it was a felony to drop a lit cigarette into the Volga River because it was a, a fire hazard. A river was a fire hazard. So we should bear this in mind. But of course, number one, a libertarian would, properly speaking, would think of, of pollution as being a form of aggression. If it is a form of trespass onto your property and does damage to, to your health or, and to your property, then it ought to be actionable. And there's that great uh, article, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, where Murray Rothbard lays out exactly how that would be dealt with in a free society. So first of all, it's a caricature to think that, well, we libertarians, we love pollution. Like, yeah, that's how we know that industry is really cranking things out. Like, if I'm not coughing, it's not capitalist. That's not, <laughs> not really how we think. But also, property rights are what make possible the care of the environment. Now, we get told, for example, that the American Indians, they didn't have private property. They were uh, purer than that. They were like Rousseau's noble savage. 
This is all a fantasy invented by people who couldn't care less about the real truth of the American Indians. They just want to exploit these people on behalf of central planning. The fact is that numerous American Indian tribes, not only did they have private property, but they assigned property rights, for example, in hunting. They would say, this family can hunt in this area. Well, that's good, because if you don't assign that, then everybody's just going to kill every animal in that area. Because if nobody owns the area, if they do own the area, they think, well, if I kill all the animals, the next year there ain't going to be no animals. So I guess I don't want to kill them all now. I want to, because I, I, I can enjoy the capital value, long-term value of this land. I better not kill all of them now. I better leave some to reproduce. But if there's no private property, and you try to do that, you try to say, you know what? I'm going to restrain myself. I'm not going to kill all the animals. I'm going to wait till next year. Then somebody else just come in and kill them because you have no property right in it. So the incentive then in, under public property is for everybody to kill as much as possible right away so that nobody else gets it. But as soon as you assign a property right in it, you have the urge to care for it. This is also true in the Pacific Northwest. The American Indians assigned uh, fishing rights for salmon so that there wouldn't be overfishing. People would just fish out all the salmon, leaving nothing for, for the following year. So uh, there's a lot of common sense to, to the libertarian position. Well, wouldn't the free market, free market, we're, we're taught in school, if we have what you people are calling for, I mean, it sounds nice when you talk about it, but really it's going to lead to monopolies. It's going to lead to wicked people, short little people with white mustaches carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them running around. They're going to be running the economy. And that's what you libertarians want. You love corporations, man. Well, okay, for one thing, if we love corporations so much, how come they don't donate to us? Okay? <laughs> there are some corporations that would rather see the whole world burn to the ground than have a free market. But in fact, this whole free market yields monopolies thing, first of all, it comes in part from what we, again, what we learned in, in junior high school. Because I remember when I was in junior high school, I just couldn't believe how anyone could support the market economy. I couldn't understand this. It leads to these monopolists who dominate the economy by the throat, and only our progressive leaders could possibly emancipate us from this terrible serfdom and all that. But when you actually look at it, it's true. You have some really predatory entrepreneurs who are using their political connections to get them special benefits, tariffs that protect them from competition and whatever. But when you look at people who didn't do that, you actually have people I don't see why I'm supposed to despise. Why am I supposed to despise Cornelius Vanderbilt, for example? This is a guy who, before he even got, before he got into railroads later in his career, he's a guy who defied the government's steamboat monopoly uh, in the New York area. And then when the monopoly was overturned, he competed with, the, with existing steamboat companies. And he would say, well, you want to go from A to B? It used to be $3 a trip. Now it's $0.10 cents a trip on my, on my boat. Or on some trips, he would say, it, it costs you nothing. You can ride for free, but I hope you're hungry because I'll make money selling you food. This was a, an astonishing contribution to the world. Or then he, he, uh, he used his railroad or, uh, to uh, transport mail. And he's transporting mail across the country. And he's competing against a subsidized railroad line. He's getting government money. And he's still doing it for a quarter of the rate. And the subsidized line goes out of business and he prospers. Why am I supposed to dislike a benefactor of mankind like this? Why am I, why am I taught that this is the wicked person but the great, wise, benign, benevolent people are these U.S. presidents whose faces look down upon me from the top of the classroom wall. Why is that? Well, it's a rhetorical question. So, there's, of course, we talk about Andrew Carnegie. Single-handedly, single-handedly, the guy reduces the price of steel rails in a quarter century from $160 a ton to $17 a ton. I'm supposed to hate that guy? Now, Rockefeller, okay, you could talk about the things he, you know, his foundation did, whatever. That's a separate question. I'm talking about as an entrepreneur. I mean, this is a guy who takes the price of kerosene and drops it from a dollar to ten cents. Now, the government can't ever do anything like this. Th this improves everybody's standard of living. Because now everything that uses that as an input gets cheaper. Everything that uses steel as an input gets cheaper. People's standard of living rises across the board. All the government can do is take stuff from some people and give it to you. And that is, not only is that a, a wash, it's a dead weight loss because of the inefficiencies and everything else involved. But these people actually did improve people's standard of living. And this goes on today, and we are taught to despise people who are involved in commerce. We're taught to be total jerks to store clerks, for example. You treat store, and I say you, present company accepted, but we're taught to treat store clerks like garbage. You know, like a, one th there's one tiny thread wrong on your clothes, and I mean, you are going to make hell over this thing. 
Whereas the TSA is sticking their hands down your pants and you're going, well, you do what you got to do, man. Like, there's something wrong here, right? I mean, people have got to be schooled to think this way because that is not a normal reaction to this. Also, so, okay, so then the claim is, but we do have monopolists and then they take over and then they can drive their competitors out of business. They just make their prices super low. Nobody compete with them. They drive everybody out of business. It's called predatory pricing. Again, I've talked about that in, in some books. I have an article coming out on this from the Future of Freedom Foundation uh, in a little while. But for now, I'll just say that there's almost no evidence of, the, of this ever actually happening. There are firms that drive other firms out of business, yes, but that's consumers drive those firms out of business, not the firm, really. But where, where's the, uh, the suddenly high prices that they're supposed to then impose on the rest of us? They, ne they never materialize. And there are a whole lot of reasons for that. There are a whole lot of reasons that predatory pricing is a counterproductive strategy. And there are a whole lot of, of ways, market mechanisms, that even if that were possible, uh, that, that could fight against that. But as I say, I've got an article coming out on this, and, and uh, I have so much else to say. I'll put that as a, as a footnote. Check TomWoods.com. Eventually, there'll be an article on predatory pricing. But I have talked about that in my Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. And finally, the antitrust laws. Notice that antitrust complaints do not typically come from consumers. Consumers do not go to the government and say, I am so sick and tired of paying so little for this product. I am so sick and tired of getting this product for free. Please do something about it. Never has. It's always the competitor. That should tell you something about what the real interests involved in that are. Okay, but wouldn't we, things would be unsafe. Right? We, there would be quacks taking advantage of us. We're too stupid to look after ourselves. So these are the same people who say, we're smart enough to vote for people who are going to make decisions that are of momentous historic significance that can affect the whole world. We're smart enough to do that, but we're too stupid to pick a doctor. Like we can't just look at, you know, take one second on the internet and find some basic clearinghouse of, of doctors who are respect. We can't do it. We're too stupid to do that for our own health. However, we can vote for a guy who's going to make uh, policy against Iran. I, I, it seems to me it's either one or the other, but you can't, you can't uh, have this kind of contradiction. But when we think about something like occupational licensing. The state has to license people because otherwise we'll all be taken advantage of. Well, again, not only are there private certification agencies all over the place, I mean, there is even, even in terms of regulation, Underwriters Laboratories <laughs> certifies electrical products. That's a private organization. It puts its seal of approval on a product. And if that product is unsafe, Underwriters Laboratories is ruined. Whereas if, a, if some government bureaucracy puts its symbol on there and it's unsafe, are they ruined? Are they ruined? No, their budget doubles. They're not ruined. Look at the incentive that's, that's there. But also think about whenever you see some requirement that this or that occupation has to get a special government license, ask yourself this. Do the existing firms in that industry have to comply with the requirements for the license? So for instance, sometimes they increase the number of hoops you have to jump through to get the license. They say, well, from now on, all the flower arrangers now have to prove that they can do X or Y. Do they ever apply that retroactively to the existing flower arrangers? Never. Of course not. Now, if this were really for the general public's well-being, wouldn't we be equally as threatened by bad existing flower arrangers as we would be from new entrants to the field? And yet it's only to the new entrants that they apply these regulations. Could it be that this is meant that way? Could it be that Adam Smith's insight that you can't get businessmen together for three seconds without them angling against the public in one way or another, that maybe he was right? Ah, well, indeed. And then, moreover, I didn't pick that at random. There are some states that require flower arrangers to be licensed. Think of the dangers we averted there. <laughs> but what about the arts and sciences, though? I mean, it's really nice of us to talk about freedom and we cooperate on the market. These miracles take place. But there'd be no art if it weren't for the government. If there weren't a Joe Biden paternally watching over all of us, I mean, every artist in the world would just put his paintbrush down and say, I just can't go on. <laughs> is, that, is that the case? Well, you know what? It, actually, the fact is that when you look at the National Endowment for the Arts, I mean, what is it? I don't even remember what its budget is these days. It might be $200 million a year. However, the amount of money that is voluntarily given by people to the arts every year is in the billions of dollars. And in fact, what in fact do we wind up getting from government arts? Do we get the best artists? Is that what typically happens? No, what we get is artists who happen to be good at filling out government grant applications. These tend not to be the best artists, by the way. Just might think of that. Yeah, what about the sciences, though? Now, surely you people can't be such Neanderthals. I mean, 
Without government involvement, we'd have no science. Nobody would even be interested in the science. We'd all be worshiping thunder, you know, or sacrificing an ox to Thor or something if it weren't for government funding of the sciences. But it turns out, again, if you look actually at history, you look at before people's fortunes were being decimated by death taxes and income taxes and all that, the private sector vastly outperformed the public sector in donations to the sciences. I mean, we're not even close. Same thing with welfare spending, by the way. So there's that. And then there, there are government arguments, well, uh, you know, people can't capture the profits of science for themselves, or there's no profit in basic science. I talk about this in rollback a little bit longer. The key book on this, if you are interested in the sciences, is this wonderful book by Terence Keeley, K-E-A-L-E-Y, called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. And man, the scientific establishment absolutely hated him for writing this book, where he showed that it is, it, this is, uh, the claims that are made for government science funding are, are every single one of them is faulty. Not one of them actually conforms to the observed data. And moreover, what typically happens with government science funding is that one point of view is privileged. Because politicians are not, they feel like they can't get away with funding this approach to cancer cures and that contradictory approach to cancer cures because they're afraid taxpayers will say, hey, you're, you're funding different things. They're gonna, half of these things are going to be wrong. So what they do is they say, what's the consensus among scientists? They pour all the money into the consensus. And that builds up this one way of thinking. Anybody who's a dissenter from that is immediately ostracized, marginalized, can't get any attention. And so science becomes inevitably politicized. We're also told that if, we, if it's just you and me interacting and exchanging things, we cause depressions. Depressions just occur spontaneously on the market. People become greedy at a particular moment and then suddenly depressions occur. There's not enough spending, like whatever the rationale is, we're told that depressions occur. But our answer to that is that depressions are not natural to the market economy. There's no reason for them to be natural to the market economy. Businesses going out of business, that happens. Not everybody can anticipate what consumers are gonna want. Sometimes you produce a product, people don't want it. You go out of business, that's gonna happen. But why would a whole cluster of businesses go out of business at once, at the same time? Why would that happen? And so uh, what we do is we refer to the Austrian School of Economics, which teaches that when you have a crummy central bank that interferes with the economy, it deforms the economy. It's, it lowers interest rates artificially and it encourages investment in the wrong lines of production. It encourages investments that wouldn't have seemed profitable if it weren't for these artificially low interest rates. And so the economy becomes deformed. We, we begin to see uh, sectors of the economy expand that wouldn't have expanded otherwise that the economy would be saying normally, no, don't expand that, expand here. And as time goes on, it requires more and more money being printed to sustain these artificial firms and artificial lines of production. But they can't keep printing money and creating money over and over because ultimately they'll destroy the currency. So eventually they have to stop the inflation. And then all this production that's been propped up that can't survive without these artificial infusions of money, they, they fail. And then you get this depression. And then we're told we caused that. The government had nothing to do with that. That's because of us. And if only they had been able to crack some more skulls, they could have prevented this depression. It's, it's, everything is always our fault. The financial crisis was our fault. Inflation is our fault. That's greedy businessmen. That's labor unions. It's never the government's fault. They're always innocent bystanders. Now, if you're seven years old, you might be satisfied with explanations like those, but after a while, you have to say, maybe the government has an interest in making us think that all good things are caused by it, and all the bad things are caused because we don't have enough of them. The fact is, in this most recent financial crisis, you know how many agencies, state and federal, we have in this country whose job it is to regulate financial markets? 115. So, you mean to tell me that if we, had had, if we had just had 116, then we wouldn't have had this crisis. These regulators, we had plenty of them. None of them saw the crisis coming, almost none of them. And most of these people, let's face it, are not the brightest bulbs in their class. If you go to business school, you do not say to yourself, I can't wait to get out so I can work for the SEC. No, does not happen, doesn't happen. That's the kids who are at the bottom of the class and they say, oh, I guess I gotta go work for the SEC and they wind up being time-serving drones, and the kids who graduate at the top of their class run rings around. It is not for lack of, of regulators that we had this problem. The who's the chief regulator of the banking system? The Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve Chairman.
Did they perceive that there were problems uh, coming down the line? Greenspan told everybody you should take out um, adjustable rate mortgages and that the fundamentals are sound. Bernanke said there's no housing bubble. Uh, appraisement practices are sound. Lending practices are great. Everybody should get in with both hands. That's what these people said. Greenspan, this guy's supposed to be like in charge of everything. We're, we're supposed to just bow down in front of this guy. He's the wise planner, the former saxophone player turned Federal Reserve Chairman. We're supposed to say, oh my gosh, Alan, you know what interest rates should be. We're too stupid to decide them on our own. You better tell us what it is. And, and the thing is, he would say things like, I'm not kidding. He would say things like, I had this feeling in my gut. And so I decided to lower interest rates by 25 basis points. A feeling in his gut? And meanwhile, you've got people who were who practically worshipped this guy. You, you remember um, the story of, of uh, Stephen Glass? He was a reporter for the New Republic magazine. And they made this wonderful movie about him, Shattered Glass. Because he used to just make up his stories. He invented the stories. People would say, gosh, how does he break all these fascinating stories? Because he invented them. He just made them up. They didn't actually occur. So one of the stories that he invented was that some Wall Street investors had, had built a shrine to Greenspan with flowers and candles and an image of Greenspan, and they would gather together and meditate there. Now, that was a made-up story, but the point is nobody noticed that was a made-up story. People thought, yeah, that seems plausible. That is creepy. I mean, this is what, this is what we are taught, the type of disgusting, superstitious reverence we are taught to have for these people. And then it turns out they're dead wrong. Greenspan even was interviewed, I, I, was it was a Diane Sawyer, I can't remember. She, he was interviewed not long ago, and she played a portion of his congressional testimony. Total gibberish that makes no sense whatsoever. And she asked him to explain what this meant. And he admitted that he was just making stuff up. He was trying to throw Congress off the track, and he fig basically he figured Congress doesn't know anything about monetary policy, so you just go blah, 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 and they'll just go, yes, sir, yes, sir, when's lunch? And so it turns out, that even Greenspan himself, he said, he called it, well, what I was using there was syntax destruction. <laughs> so he's even got his own weirdo phrase for it. So think about this now. So, these, the, so this is a guy who's in charge of the money supply, and he admits that he just blabs and blabs about nothing to throw Congress off the track. Meanwhile, he's totally clueless about what's going on. And we're supposed to repose our confidence in these people. And that you and I, who are skeptical of this, there's something wrong with us. We must be antisocial or something if you don't like Alan Greenspan. Something wrong here. Now, ultimately, what does it boil down to, though? We can answer all these objections all day long. It basically boils down to there are two ways to acquire wealth. You can create wealth by serving your fellow man. That's the way uh, a civilized person creates wealth. Or you can expropriate people. You can loot people. At the point of a gun, you can take stuff. That's it. Everything boils down, one way or another, boils down to one of those two original ways. Well, it's obvious which way our society has chosen. So we have agriculture subsidies that help the farmer and that, that basically amount to a gun in the ribs of everybody else. We have sugar quotas that steal on behalf of the sugar producers. We've got the Export-Import Bank, which diverts credit to certain favored firms. We've got the Federal Reserve, which diverts credit to certain favored firms. And this just goes on and on and on and on, not to mention all the other things, the military-industrial complex. All of this occurs through the barrel of a gun. And we have to ask ourselves, is this the most humane way for human beings to interact with each other at the, end of, at the point of a gun? It's indirect. Sure, we hire somebody else to, to uh, wield the guns. Is there really no other way we can live than by my group impoverishes the rest of you and enriches itself, and then your group is going to impoverish us and enrich itself. What if we just stopped doing that? Wouldn't be a, a lot richer? So it really boils down to, is the foundation of civilization peace and free exchange and voluntary interaction of, of individuals? Or is the foundation of civilization, as the state would have it, the gun, the badge, and the hangman? The state has warped our moral sense and taught us that looting and aggression are okay as long as they're done by majority vote. And it has turned us against each other. It has taken natural harmonies and replaced them with disharmony. And it is at this time that we ought to recall with Murray Rothbard that what we are really faced with in society is not a conflict of rich versus poor or white versus black 
or city versus country, or industry versus agriculture, but all of us against the parasites who live off our labor and train us to believe that there is no other way to live. There is another way to live, and it's called liberty, and join us. Thank you. That's the first one. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, now that's speech number one. The second speech is much shorter. It's like, it's a, I can't even dignify it as a speech. It's like five minutes of pep talk. But I do want to give a pep talk. I don't want to just give a speech just for non-libertarians. Be a little weird at a libertarian convention. So a few little things, and then afterward I'm going to zip over to my... The, the glasses were nice enough to let me use some of their table. So I have a few titles. I'll be sitting there chit-chatting with folks. Although, you know, at 1.30 you've got to beat back. So don't you get in trouble. Don't blame me if you're out here talking to me. You know, I, I didn't tell you to do that. Okay, I just want to give just a little bit of advice or just thoughts about libertarians and libertarian political activism. And this is not dogmatic. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine. You know, these are honorable, sources of honorable disagreement. But first thing that I would think to say to somebody who wants to run as a libertarian is do not run on lower taxes and lower spending. Of course, we favor lower taxes and lower spending, but unless you're going to say that I pretty much want I mean, so low that you can't believe how low I want the taxes and spending to be, then people will just vote Republican. Because they'll just say, well, you know, libertarians have a hard time winning, Republicans are more likely to win, so I just vote for the Republican. If you're just Republican light, why would people vote for you? And you could say, oh, but I'll actually stick to my word. Yeah, but they all say that. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, I'm going to repeal regulations. I'm, yeah, yeah. You've got to have some, only you can figure out what, what your, your unique, unique spin on the liberty message is. But you better have that spin to distinguish yourself. Of course, you've got to use YouTube these days. And I, would, I think Gary Johnson, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I think he's done some very good ads so far. Distinguishing himself from the two parties. And I think that's a critical thing. And I would, I would, make an, I would basically just say that the likelihood that libertarians are going to get the 65 and over demographic is very, very low. Very unlikely because Ron Paul couldn't get it. I don't mean you ever write anybody off. But I mean, I'd love to see an ad where you got one person represents the Republicans, one person represents the Democrats, one of them's driving a red Buick, and the other one's driving a blue Buick, and then you got the super cool libertarians. Like, hey, don't you want to be like us? Wouldn't that be better? Anyway, that's my own sort of thought. Okay, so uh, second thing is do not neglect foreign policy. There was a period, obviously, if you're running for state office, I think you can safely neglect foreign policy. But there was a time in the history of the Libertarian Party where you know, you could find a lot of people who were, I think this is over, thankfully, more interested in science fiction than in foreign policy. That, 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 those days are over, okay, because some of the state's worst crimes are carried out in the area of foreign policy. If you want to distinguish yourself from the other parties, that is a clear way to do it, because there is a bipartisan foreign policy consensus that has done nothing but harm to this country, and you cannot run away from that. And when, when Murray Rothbard was, was helping to write the initial uh, Libertarian Party platform, he had, to, he had to claw his way to making sure that foreign policy was given pride of place. He said, this is the key issue. James Madison said this was the key issue. I mean, war is what brings in its train so many forms of oppression. It cannot be neglected. This is, this is an essential uh, issue. Uh, thirdly, the Murray Rothbard is radioactive thing needs to come to an end. There are people who, now you notice I made respectful reference to Milton Friedman. He had many important contributions that we respect. However, um, Rothbard was a great man. I don't mean you have to worship him. I don't mean you have to agree with every word he ever said. I don't mean you have to belong to a cult of Rothbard. I don't mean you have to wave incense in front of him. But for heaven's sake, somebody writes a thousand page economic treatise that is praised by Ludwig von Mises, who was not exactly copious in his praise, if you know anything about him, uh, who, who at, in, in his 20s and 30s, was so conversant with economic literature that he knew the, the mainstream inside and out. Look at the footnotes in Man, Economy, and State. In his spare time, he writes a four-volume history of colonial America. He publishes uh, libertarian newsletters. He founds the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, the Journal of Libertarian Studies. He writes wor works of history on the Great Depression that are astonishing in their scope and their effectiveness. He writes a, a study of the Panic of 1819 that's praised by every academic journal. One, one could, I mean, look at who's a movie reviewer. 
his correspondence is this big. You would write to him. He would write you back, even though how did he find the time? He's writing all these big books on an old typewriter. I mean, this, maybe you didn't agree with every strategic decision he made, but, you know, whoever's infallible in this room will, will drop Rothbard and follow you. But this guy is a hero who helped to found this very institution that we're, we're, we're sitting here uh, uh, celebrating. So this whole thing where the only libertarians in the world are Hayek, Friedman, and John Stossel, <laughs> that's, got, that's it, that's, that's got to go. And you know who I mean when I say these things. And that's not to say that we shouldn't respect John Stoss. I'm not, in no way am I taking anything away from those people. I'm not trying to take away, I'm trying to give. Okay, always give. And then finally, one small little thing, and I, I hope I won't seem like an ungrateful guest, because believe me, I am extremely grateful to be here. Um, but I noticed that on the sign, I was going to say this anyway, and then I saw on the sign it says this for the Texas Libertarian. So just a, a gentle... Um, correction from my point of view. I don't think it's a good idea to describe libertarians as being fiscally conservative and socially liberal. I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. Because that, for one thing, I mean, if you're really, really, really pressed for time, I could maybe see that, but I think, it, first of all, it makes us sound like we don't really have a philosophy. We just borrow a little bit from these people, a little bit from the, those people, and hey, we've taken the things that we think you might like, and we've kind of mashed them together even though they don't really make sense. That's not true at all. We have the most consistent philosophy of anybody who ever lived. Our philosophy is we're against the initiation of violence. That's it. And whatever follows from that, that's what we believe. That's it. Very simple. And also, think of, I mean, the words fiscally conservative have been corrupted, I think, beyond hope. I don't want to be confused with those people, okay? I, people, oh, I'm fiscally conservative. I just want the deficit to be only 800 billion. Yeah, you know what? We are a different species of, of person from, from that. But now, I, just so that you won't think all I do is gripe, because it's not griping, it's just some constructive criticism. I want to point out a little, a few th just one quick thing that we should be happy about. The fact that we have been out of power, we have not been in the inner circle. There's one good silver lining to that. And that is, as the wheels are coming off, and they are coming off fast, in Europe, where I just came back from, they are coming off fast in Europe. And they're coming off here too. They can't possibly blame us for this. <laughs> People are going to be looking for answers. And they're going to be looking for answers not from the same old people who caused all the problems. They're going to be willing, more willing than ever to look in places that they wouldn't have thought they would have looked even five years ago. And that's the gap we have to fill. Now, I know it's a cliche to say the Internet has opened up a lot of possibilities for us, but it's absolutely true. Now, it's also true that on the Internet you can read Time magazine. You can read mainstream opinion. But the point is you could read mainstream opinion before the Internet. But you couldn't really find us. I mean, and if you did, by accident... You know, if you want to find out about our philosophy, you've got to send a self-addressed stamped envelope to some address somewhere, and, you know, three weeks later you get a, a pamphlet. But today, we can, we can reach people in, in ways that are astonishing. And so what I want to urge people to do is something that I've been urging people to do uh, in a lot of the places that I've been stopping. You have ways to reach people that are free. You can start your own blog and it's free. And you should, you should do that. And, and just you say, well, I'm already really busy. Just, just get more efficient. We can all get more efficient. Carve out 20 minutes a day and just write on that blog. What do I write about? Well, if current events aren't enough to chew on, or if you feel like, well, I, I don't have enough original to say. Other people are talking about current events. Read. There's a, plenty of good stuff to read. Just write about what you're reading. And that'll help somebody. Somebody else who's going to be reading that thing will help that person navigate. Just write, write down what your thoughts are about what you're reading. I actually made up a thing. I know we're not just about economics. We're about the whole package. But I'm interested in economics. So I wrote up a free resource because people kept asking, what should I read? I want to become interest, uh, knowledgeable in Austrian economics. So I wrote up learnaustrianeconomics.com. So you can go there and this link to almost all the resources are online for free or you can listen to them. So get a few of those and just, just start writing about them. And this will help somebody. It will help you. It will make you a better writer. It will help you organize your thoughts better. There will be no time in your life when you're going to say, gosh, I'm so sorry I wasted time becoming a good writer and thinker. That was just out the window that time. You're not going to say that to yourself. Secondly, everybody can have a YouTube channel. It's amazing. You can comment on things. And it's free. Start your own YouTube channel 
And it's free. It's amazing. You should do that. And this will help you get over your fears of speaking. There won't be an audience right in front of you, but you'll be surprised. You're also, it's also nerve-wracking to speak in front of just the camera. In some ways, that's more nerve-wracking because you don't know if anyone's going to laugh at your jokes or not. You know, this is just out there in the ether. But this is free. I, I have a friend, and I keep badgering him. I keep saying to this friend, and this is my form of saying, you better do this because someone's going to take this idea. I have a friend who's very, very, very smart. I'm blessed because I travel in these circles to know a ton of geniuses. This guy knows a lot about economics. And I said, you know what you should do? You start a YouTube channel, and every week you make an eight-minute YouTube critiquing Paul Krugman's column. And you call it, you just call, you simply call the channel the Anti-Krugman. You will be a sensation. Everyone will tune into this thing every week. A sensation. And then you link back to your, your, uh, your blog and you get more traffic for your blog and, and you build yourself up and everybody's happy. Like, why would you not do this? Th these sorts of things are at your fingertips. I mean, that's a million dollar idea. Why won't he do it? I don't know, but I'm going to send him. I hope this video gets online. I'm going to say, all right, look, you've got like 10 more seconds to start doing this because I just told people this idea. Somebody's going to do it. But the point is, think of what your niche is. And we got to be all over this thing. Because, and, and by the way, I, I figured out what my, my niche is. Because, okay, I, I do public speaking and I write. And that helped me figure out my niche because, and again, this is not just self-deprecating humor, I'm really not good at anything else. Like, I'm not good at anything else. Like, I, I'm, when I see a carpenter come to do work on my house, to me, he's like a magician. I, I have absolutely no idea how I'm looking at this unfinished part of my basement. And then a few weeks later, I walk in there and it's like a paradise. I, 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 if I had 10 lifetimes, I couldn't even conceive of how this is done. Or fixing my car. See, my wife grew up in rural Oklahoma. So she can fix a flat tire, she can shoot a deer, she can do all this stuff. Right? I, I am just so pathetic compared to this, this woman. I, I, don't, I don't know how my car works. As, as, as I've said before, as far as I know, there's an angel in there that makes it go. I, I have no idea. So this, this being the only thing I can do, I started up something where I said, in the same way that we can create our own alternative media, instead of trying to make sure that ABC employs good reporters, that, that, that's pretty hopeless, or instead of make, sh make sure the New York Times hires good reporters, that's a hopeless cause and the New York Times is going down the tubes anyway, so who cares? Mm -hmm. Create your own. So I thought in the same way, I'm always griping about these professors and they fill the kids' heads with, with uh, nonsense, and it's a good thing these kids are drunk anyway and they can't retain any of this information. <laughs> And I gripe about it, but then I thought, you know, a lot better than griping and being a lazy bum, because any lazy bum can gripe. Why don't you create something? So I thought, why don't I, I have a PhD in U.S. history, why don't I just teach like a liberty U.S. history? Like this is what people should know about U.S. history, and I'll just teach that myself using this mechanism. So I've gotten a few of my friends whom I trust. I have a guy who teaches economics for me. So I just started a site called libertyclassroom.com. And it's the most exciting thing I've ever done. So there's stuff for everybody to do. So we are involved then in a struggle that isn't going to have a quick resolution. Because this is a struggle that goes back as far as you can go in human history. The struggle between liberty and power. In fact, if you have any books by Liberty Fund, uh, you, you open them up and on the inside cover, they have this cuneiform script from ancient Sumer, from one of the earliest recorded civilizations, and the script means liberty. So we have this going back to at least 3000 BC, this struggle, at least in recorded history. And this is going to be a struggle that will persist long after we're dead. So we shouldn't be looking for quick, immediate, short-term gains, although we should welcome them when they occur. But we should be in this for the long haul, be prepared for discouragement, and remind ourselves that we're doing the right thing. We have made so many wonderful friendships in this course of this struggle. We've expanded our horizons. I've learned so much, because I know, I know some history and economics, but there are a lot of things I don't know about that I've learned from all of you folks. It's a privilege to be involved in, in this movement, and I hope you'll always think of it that way. And thanks again for, for having me.
just a programming announcement. If Elizabeth Miller is here, she can come up. 